mother is willing to do anything for her child. You know, even jump in front of a bullet. Yet, we don't seem to understand that God is willing to do more than that for us. And, and whenever we're facing some sort of trial or problem, I don't know, but I've seen people saying, well, God does not give me this because I cannot handle it. No, he didn't give you that problem. So you got to get out of that mentality. Okay, this is my child. I'm willing to do this for them because I don't want them to suffer. God is willing to do the same for you and more because we are his children. That's right. Amen. So that's what he was talking to me this morning when, when I was taking a shower. Uh, I don't know. Just, we just got have to get rid of that because nothing bad that is in our, in our, happening in our lives comes from him. It's a result of one of three things. A consequence of the fallen world that we live in, a bad decision that we made, or we allow the devil to get into our way of thinking. Mm -hmm. So with him, we can overcome anything. And so for me, it's when I'm driving here. <laughs> Right? So he gets out of the shower, God speaks to him, and then I'm driving here, and I hear um, a whisper, or I hear a lyric in a song, and I have to just shut the radio off, and I'm like, okay, I'm listening. You know, you just have that, he's tugging at your ear, right? And the lyric was, he is awakening his hope in me by calling forth my destiny. And I thought, well, hope and faith seem to go against each other. If I believe, then why do I have to hope? Yes, yes. But it's his hope. Yes. And so I started thinking about this, and I felt so strongly that God was trying, or that the enemy was trying to steal someone's hope. That these holidays, like Mother's Day, like these are difficult days for some people. That there are people who feel so alone, and, and some of these holidays can just make that aloneness feel sometimes overbearing. Someone who's lost a child today on Mother's Day. Someone who's never had a child, who longs for that child. A, a, a parent who, whose heart is just breaking or someone who wants to be a parent. And so the, the scripture that, and so, and now abideth faith, hope, and love. These three, but the greatest of these is love. It's his hope. It's his hope that he has placed in our heart. And Tom asked on Friday night, what are we hoping for? Do we still take them to hope? Do we still take time to let our hearts think and, and our minds kind of wander and imagine? God has given us a vivid imagination. Yes. And sometimes we just get so busy and so caught up in the motions and, and in, in the daily life. And who is it that God has put around us? Right. I was thinking about that too. Like, who do we know that we can reach out to maybe on a day like today? Who do we know that maybe needs a word of encouragement? Because the enemy loves nothing more than to make us feel alone. Right. Nothing more than to get us off by ourselves where those doubts and those fears can come yes. take hold. And we need people in our lives. Yes. You know, having my husband here next to me Friday night was powerful. Like, it's different. Like, it's different to, to see those prophecies come forth when there's two that God has put together. You know, and, and it makes me think of how many years I spent praying for my other half. Praying for someone that would be the other half of my whole. And, and I'm telling you guys, the church can be a lonely place when you're single. The, yes. the church is, is filled with couples that, that have those kind of marriages that you long for. And it can be very lonely. Yes. And so I was thinking about that. And what are we hoping for? God has put a hope in your heart. Yes. And do not let it be deterred. Yes. And, and look around. Do we see people that are struggling in their hope? We can believe, but, boy, the hopes, those can just slowly and quietly die away. And that is a joy. There is a, the, the hope springs eternal, right? Yes. It's a well. Yes. It's a source of strength for us. Yes. A joyful expectation. Right. What are you joyfully expecting? God has good things for us. Yes. And God has good things for all those around us. But yes. we need to remember as, you know, love. Right. It's God's yes. love. It's God's hope. And it's God's faith. And we need all three of them together to work yes. in perfect yes. harmony. And it's the perfect expression of who God is yes. and how he wants yes. us to be to one another. Yes. So 
be encouraged. Happy Mother's Day to yes. those that are mothers. Happy Mother's Day to those that are not yet mothers that will be. Yes. And for those that have heavy hearts this morning, hope. God has put his hope in you and is calling forth your destiny. Yes. And your children, we speak that to our children, that they are growing and fulfilling their destiny yes. as well. In Jesus' name. Amen. So with that, does anybody have anything else that they would like to share this morning or any prayer requests or any needs that we would join together in this morning? Yes.
He said, hold my hand, and I will lead you through this place. Yes. And I, I wondered all these years, what, what are you talking about? But finally, 50 wow. years later, I begin to understand that these are all the things we all go through. Yeah. He promised he'd lead us through. Yes. Amen. But our faith has to be in him. Yes. Yes. He is more than yes. able to accomplish yes. what he yes. said. she wanted most, she, she didn't want a, a card or flowers on Mother's Day if the girls didn't treat her good all year long, you know, mm -hmm. and if they treat her good all year long, that made it very special, but if you leave your mom the rest of the year and all of a sudden you give her a card, tell you to love her, that really doesn't mean anything, right. you know, and, and I just I just was thinking as you guys were saying, you know, God wants us to go to him constantly and have a relationship constantly, mm -hmm. not just run to him when we have trouble, sure. yeah. but to have that constant relationship with them. That's what makes love very special. And God wants us just to open his heart. Like when Hezekiah and Sennacherib would come and he just spread everything before the Lord and just lay it out and realize natural, there's no way we can defeat Sennacherib. There's no way we can do that. And sometimes we have situations like, it says, God, it's all you. There is absolutely no way, no way we can do it. And it's like, you know, Moses leading them uh, through the wilderness to come to the Red Sea. Well, it was like you had the Red Sea on one side, the Egyptian dust was coming from the other, and it's like, you know, God, what do you want to do? You know, yeah. just let them know I'm going to work. Let them see the salvation. Let them see I'm going to take care of Moses. Yeah. You just tell them to go forward. And, sure. and, and God's always a forward God, yeah. and he's a very present help right now, a yeah. present help. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, because when, when Peter was sinking, I always think about when he was sinking in the water, that prayer, when he cried out to God, that prayer had to be answered right now. Okay. That wouldn't help a week later. That would be answered. answered right at that moment. Yeah. But when you have a relationship and you call out to God, yeah. you know, then, then there's something more powerful than that. You know you love him. Because mm -hmm. I remember going to the store one time and I was with my youngest and I bought her something and she just turned and said, thank you. And that is so powerful yeah. in God's eyes yeah. when his child is thankful yeah. for what he does. You might not understand it, What's going on? Sometimes we go through hurts and, yep. and we go through those trials and God, we don't understand. But one thing we do know, we trust you. Yeah. Yeah. That yeah. you know what's yeah. best yeah. for yeah. us. Even we don't. That, yeah. That's why you don't give a, a car keys to a six-year-old kid. <laughs> you give a license. Not that he, he could. Some are big enough to probably physically get in there and drive the car, but they, they don't, they're not yet capable of doing it the way it should be done right. Mm -hmm. And sometimes in our life, we want something right now. And God says, okay, I'll give it to you, but I need to give it to you a little later. I need to have you grow up until that point. Wow. You know, and, and sometimes all God wants is just to tell me, Kim, you love me every day. You appreciate me every day. And you're willing to listen to me every day. And I teach school. And, and the students that do the best are the ones that listen to the instructor. When yeah. they fight the instructor, when they think we're stupid or something like that, it's a long way for them to get to the final. <laughs> yeah. But the ones who listen and respect you, and that's what God wants. It's amazing. When Jesus, when Jesus was on earth, and, he, and we see him coming to be baptized, and, and, and the voice, this is my son, and, and, and throughout the scripture kind of tells that, this is my son, beloved son, and one of them said, hear him. Yeah. Hear him. Yeah. And that's what God wants to do. Hear what Jesus is saying to mm -hmm. us. Amen. He's always looking Amen. out for our best.
Ask the Lord to bless the service. Ask the Lord to bless the mothers and, yes. and to touch the hurting hearts and to stir up the hope in all of our hearts. Yes. Jesus. Yes. We come before you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that you never leave us, you never forsake us. We thank you, Lord, that you are faithful, Lord, that when you speak into our lives, Lord, that you will accomplish in our days on this earth that which you have said you will do. We lift up all the mothers today, Lord, today. We thank you, Lord, for our mother's love. Lord, natural mothers, Lord, spiritual mothers, Lord, people who have just nourished and helped us grow in you, Lord. Those who speak forth love and peace and truth, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We ask your blessing, Lord. Your blessing, Lord. Peace and love and hope, Lord. Jesus, we thank you, Lord, this day, Lord. We thank you for this body, Lord. We ask you to encourage those that need encouragement, Lord. We ask you, Lord, to be with us as we lift you up and magnify you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for your unfailing love, Lord, that you are faithful, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that you lead us and guide us through the pits of this world, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that you never leave us, you never forsake us, Lord. That we call on you and you are our ever-present help in time of trouble, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that you're faithful. Thank you, Lord. We thank you today, Lord. We lift up your name and we exalt you, Lord, and we listen. We listen when you speak to our hearts, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that your hope springs in our hearts, Lord. That you sustain that hope, Lord, that you have placed in us, Lord. That you remove the doubt, Lord. That you remove the unbelief, Lord. That would that would stop us from moving in our destiny, Lord, in you. That you encourage each and every person here, Lord. That you are the lifter of our head, Lord. Yes, Lord Jesus, and you are worthy to be praised. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that you are good. a reminder that we're going to have Eastern Gatehouse Prayer on uh, Friday, May 23rd. So if you don't have anything going on, please come. Just uh, enjoy the time in the presence of the Lord. Um, I don't know if he's revealed what we'll be focusing on that night, but his heart. Yeah, his heart. Let's speak the word this morning. Will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? I am a believer, and these signs do follow me. In the name of Jesus, I cast out demons, I speak in new tongues, I lay hands on the sick, and they do recover. Lord. Christ has redeemed me from the curse of the law, therefore I forbid any sickness or disease to come upon this body. Every disease, germ, and every virus that touches this body dies instantly in the name of Jesus. Every organ and every tissue of this body functions to the perfection to which God created it to function. And I forbid any malfunction in this body in the name of Jesus. I receive the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him. The eyes of my understanding being enlightened. And I am not conformed to this world, but am transformed by the renewing of my mind. My mind is renewed by the word of God. The Lord rebukes the devourer for my sake, and no weapon that is formed against my finances will prosper. All obstacles and hindrances to my financial prosperity are now dissolved. The Lord has pleasure in the prosperity of his servant. And Abraham's blessings are mine. All right. Um, Don and um, James, you want to come take the offering today? Well, come on. Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> well, James is already standing and ready to go. Well, why don't you pray, James? Why don't you grab the offering basket? Why don't you pray?
like maybe ten minutes more than they had the time for that, so uh Hallelujah. Yes. Glory, glory, glory. Yes. Glory, glory, glory. I feel the healing presence of the Lord here today. Time to join in with the angels that are worshiping around the throne. Hallelujah. Born ready. Yes. Such a time as this. One thing that uh, Tom um, revealed that uh, the worship team will be going out to do conferences and stuff like that. And something I forgot to mention earlier. Yeah, go ahead, Tammy, so I can see you. Thank you. that uh, we'll need a portable sound system to go and we've already planted the seed laid the seed at his feet and let it grow it'll probably take about four or five thousand dollars for a portable sound system but we're just believing the lord in it so i'm just letting you know what we've prayed about and then you guys can watch it happen so hallelujah it's time for these time guys to get outside the walls and uh, as a as a team and just start touching the lives around these nations around the nations hallelujah Hallelujah. Three, one, two, three, four. Praise you, Lord.
not about doctrine or man-made ideas, not about tradition, Lord. It's about worshiping and loving you, Lord. You said where two or three are gathered, there you are also, Lord. Let your presence manifest in this place, Lord. Let the lives in this place, Lord, be touched, that your name would be glorified, your kingdom be furthered. Hallelujah. 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 Show me your face, Lord. Show me your
church glory, Lord. Who shows you glory, Lord. He's here. He's here. He's here. Does anyone in this room not feel his presence? Just tell me you love him, church. Just tell me you love him, church. Your dreams and visions be birthed in this room right now. Show us your heart, Lord. Reveal your heart through your people this day, Lord. Show us, Lord. Show us, Lord. Show us, Lord. Lord. Speak through your people, Lord, by your Spirit. Holy Spirit, move. Holy This is the realm of your glory. This is the realm of your grace. I can feel your mighty power, and it's moving in this place. There's like a burning bush in this room. There's like a burning bush in this room. Burn in me, Lord. Burn in me, Lord. You're an all-consuming fire. This is the realm of your glory. This is the realm of your grace. I can feel your mighty power, and it's moving in this place. Oh.
to explain something. Did you just feel a shift in time? We lost our tempo. We didn't lose our tempo. There was a shift in time in this room. All right? Did you feel a shift in time? Okay. Man is linear. Okay? God is not. His time is ever-present. But what you just felt in this room was a shift in time. All right? We need to step into his time because a day is like a thousand and a thousand is like a day in the presence of the Lord. Although it may can bring confusion to our minds, we just need to lean, learn to lean on him for the understanding of what just happened. Did you all feel that back? Tim, did you feel that shift? All right, I know you felt it. I know you felt it. In those moments, we need to grasp because when the total, the healing, the healing, everything is happening because it's in his presence and there is no time in his presence, okay? For years, I struggled with why did that happen? Now I'm understanding why. He's bringing revelation. It's time. Let's stop for a moment. We need to grasp it. Not think that we screwed up, but understand what just happened. Hallelujah. Because when in the presence of angels, with God's glory on their wings, like the voice of many waters, I can hear the angels sing. special feeling, but it's, it's a way for God to, uh, to let us know in a tangible way that he's here, that he's hearing our prayers, that he's, that he's seeing our needs. He's not a, a God who cannot be touched by the feelings of our infirmities. And so uh, as, as he responds, you know, it isn't always what we say, it's what's in our heart. God knows before we ever say it. He wants us to say it, that way we're expressing faith. But he already knows, and it's his desire to meet that need, to bless us in every, every area of our life. Praise the Lord. Amen. I just want to share something. Uh, I'm not going to go into all of it because it really wasn't my. I'm just stealing it, praise the Lord. But last night my wife, had uh, gone outside. She was taking pictures and, and of a rainbow, and she was praying. She didn't tell me this. She just this is just her personal stuff, you know. And she was praying that God would fulfill all of those promises that He's given us over the years. Don is, you know, like what we do. So, <clears throat> uh, just a few minutes ago, Toby and Jody came around and said they wanted to pray with us, and Jody said she had a vision. 
and she, in the vision she saw a rainbow. I'll show you how specific God can be and how prophetic you all are if you just respond. And she felt God was saying to her that he wanted us to know that he, wanted, that he was going to fulfill all of the promises that he'd given us. We just need to hold on and believe. Now, I mean, this is word for word. That's how specific God can be. Don't ever think that it takes some great name or individual to bring the presence of God or a fulfillment of prophecy or any gift. We all have that anointing in the Holy Spirit, and this is the proof. I mean, Jody's not back there saying, you know, geez, I wish I could think of something really good to say. She just said what God said. And it's exactly what Sally had said the night before. I mean, that is the Spirit giving witness to the Spirit. Amen. And it's the Spirit that's in us. That's why your testimonies are so powerful. Sometimes you think, well, I'm just rambling. No, I'm telling you, there's significance. We are overcomers by the blood of the Lamb Hallelujah. and by the word of our testimony in agreement with what He's done. It changes people's lives. It impacts people. Amen. So don't ever hesitate to, to step forward. I know sometimes you get feel awkward or you think, well, people are thinking this or thinking that. Don't worry about what they're thinking. Amen. Just You just go ahead and speak out. Amen. Let the Holy Ghost use you. And I promise you, somebody will be blessed. Amen. Somebody will get a blessing from it. Praise the Lord. Give the Lord a hand clap. Praise God. <laughs> amen. Amen. Again, thank, thank you so much, worship team. You know, Tom said this, but we've been saying it for a long time. You know, you, you hear them worship and, and sing and lead us in worship. And uh, they're the first ones to say, oh, it's not us, it's the Holy Spirit. Well, I, it is the Holy Spirit moving on them. But it sounds like hundreds up here. And I'm not talking about volume. I'm talking about it actually sounds like a whole bunch of different voices, not just five. So... It's incredible. I was listening specifically for that, and I thought, you know, if you're not looking, you're hearing all these different voices. And again, I'm not just talking about how the volume of it. I'm talking about it sounds specifically like a, all these different voices are singing at the same time. So, amen. That's, that's another evidence and witness of the, of the Holy Spirit, amen, and his anointing. When you're doing it for the Lord, praise God. It works. Hallelujah. Amen. So again, uh, happy Mother's Day to all you uh, mothers out there, and uh, amen. You're always, once a mother, always a mother. It's like being in the Marine Corps. Praise the Lord. Once, once a Marine, always a Marine. Right, Ron? Right, Dan? Praise the Lord. Who are uh, Somebody help me out here. Praise God. But that's the way it is. Mothers, I've got a mother, 92, in the nursing home. She's still my mom. I'm still her boy. Amen. And uh, likewise, with all of our children, we know how that works. Uh, mothers just never cease to be mothers. Praise the Lord. If you don't believe them, drop over to their house today and watch a mother. They'll do it. Praise the Lord. It comes natural to them. We appreciate the mothers. Amen. God had special, a special place for mothers. After all, Mary is the mother of God. Yes. Amen. So thank the Lord for mothers. Praise God. Amen. All right, Sunday school, you can be uh, dismissed. Thank the Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for your presence here this morning. Amen. And I'm going to read several scriptures here this morning. And uh, luckily, we took out a couple of pews because I got a cough drop in my mouth. And if it works like most everything else, it's liable to be in that front row before, I, <laughs> before it gets dissolved. I'm hoping not. Otherwise, it could be like sticky shrapnel. <laughs> Napalm. It's all you can't get it off, praise the Lord. But I want to start with Romans uh, chapter 5, uh, and we'll read verses 12 through 18. Thank the Lord, amen. Praise God. I do appreciate the Holy Spirit and how, how he works through his people, amen. It's just, it never ceases to amaze. I mean, no matter how many times you have things like this happen, it just 
awesome, always. Praise God. So here we are, uh, Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift, for the judgment was by one to condemnation. But the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. Okay, now let's go to Genesis chapter 2, verses 16 and 17. We have to look at this in context, I mean, in the, in the context of what we just read in Romans. The Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. Okay? Now, Genesis chapter 3, verses 6 through 8. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together, and made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. So, we've got a remarkable tendency as human beings and even as Christians to focus almost exclusively on the fruit of the problem. We do it as parents with our children. We do it as pastors with our congregations. We do it with husbands with wives and wives with husbands. We do it even with ourselves. The gospel, on the other hand, always addresses the root of the problem. And the root of the problem isn't bad behavior. Bad behavior is the fruit of something deeper. Our real enemy is death. Sins, then, are just the fruit of a much deeper problem that only God can solve. Only God. That's, that's the, what the law taught us or should have taught us. Death is the root of the problem. So Eve says to herself, this looks good. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I've been there. Amen. It's really attractive fruit. It just screams out, eat me. Praise God. Enjoy me. And after all, what a broadening uh, experience uh, it would be. Enjoyable as well. The knowledge of good and evil. I'm gonna, my horizons will be just so much greater, and I'll know so much more, and I'll be so much wiser. My husband and I are going to be like God himself. I can't be bad. The serpent makes sense. 
It'd be much better to know both, good and evil, than to just know good. Here, have some, she says to her husband, and this, this stuff is really good. It ta- it's juicy. It tastes good. It's good stuff. Oh, by the way, what did God mean by that word, die? They'd never experienced it. They didn't know death and would have never known death. All sin behavior, and I'm just, I'll just use that as a, as a way of describing, with Christians as well, it traced back to the death that happened in the Garden of Eden. That's what Paul was talking about in Romans. So to focus on behavior, this is the revelation Paul had. To focus on behavior without addressing death is to perpetuate death. Amen? In other words, the law brought an awareness that people are dead. But it didn't give them any way of, to come to life. It didn't give them life. It just proved that they were dead. So the Pharisees were the masters of this. This is why Jesus addressed it. Jesus called them whitewashed tombs. That's what he was talking about. You're dead and don't even know it. Christians are guilty of making the same mistakes. We tend to think of the gospel as as God's program to make bad people good, not dead people alive. Let's look at John 3.17. Praise the Lord. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. That's about as fundamental as it gets. For God so loved the world, remember John 3.16? How we are able to just twist that around and make it become something other than what it is, I don't know, but we've done a great job of that. But the fact is Jesus came first to effect a mortal resurrection. Amen. Not a moral reformation. That's what this scripture is talking about. We've turned it around to where it's become, okay, first there's a moral reformation, then will come a mortal resurrection. But that's not what Jesus said. Praise the Lord. Most people think the human problem is that our lives are out of adjustment somehow and that we don't meet God's expectations. This is what Don was just talking about in in the conversation he had with God. Salvation then becomes a matter of rearranging our priorities. That's what you hear and preached all the time. Praise the Lord. Adjusting our lifestyle in order to correspond with what God's will is. And in its basis form, this error leads people to think that they then earn their own salvation. Today, in a lot of churches, the error has become even more subtle so having received, and we, I hear it all the time. I hear it, you know, and I, I'm not mad at people doing it. I understand, you know, we're, we're all on a path that God's leading us, and, and it's a path of revelation. If anybody knows ever to come to God, there had to be some revelation. Then any growth within that in, initial revelation comes from further revelation. As you respond to revelation, rev, more revelation is given. Yeah. You control the tap, basically. When you stop receiving, God stops giving. It isn't, that he, it isn't that it isn't there and available, it's just that we don't receive it. Any more than the sinner out here is as much uh, ac- accepted in the eyes of God in terms of salvation. All he has to do is receive the revelation or respond to the revelation of Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, came as their Savior. But if they don't respond to that, there's never any more revelation. They just continue to wander around in darkness. So with each response in a positive way to God, there is a requisite uh, response from God that takes us to another level in him. And it never ends. It never ends in in this life. It it continues on forever. So praise the Lord. So in a lot of churches today, this this same error of somehow we are saving ourselves by our good works, it's, it's more subtle, it's disguised, but it's still there. Having received forgiveness through Jesus Christ, People are then urged to practice 
the principles that Christ gave to bring their lifestyle back into line. But you've got to understand, what Jesus was teaching and preaching was not something man was capable of doing. He was fulfilling the law as only he could and only he would. So the principles that he taught, when he says, look, you say, uh, thou shalt not kill. But I say, if you hate somebody, you've already, he's, he's raised the level or the bar in terms of uh, obedience to the law to a point where they had to say, okay, nobody can do that. And then he'd say, okay, now you get it. Now you understand what the law was for. He wasn't telling us that's what we are to do. But that's what the church has done. It's taken this subtle idea that, you know, yes, you're saved by grace, but now you've got to get your act together and line back up with whatever the will of God is. And, that's what, and then they tell us how you do that is by doing what Jesus told us to do. And Jesus wasn't telling us to do it as if we could do it. He was telling us this is what the demand is. He said, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom. In other words, the Pharisees weren't entering the kingdom. As righteous as they, their works and their acts were, they still weren't getting into the kingdom. So you had to do something way more than what they did. And again, he was just simply setting the bar back where it was intended to be in the first place, unattainable. To point out our inability to do these things. Praise the Lord. But here the, is the deal. The, the sins are just the symptom. Our problem is death. Genesis uh, 2.17. We just read it in the opening. Genesis 2.17. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. See, Adam and Eve had no sin consciousness. It wasn't that they weren't doing things that could have been identified as sin, if there had been a law there to identify it. But they were sinless, they were innocent, because there was no demand. They were without a sin consciousness, which is what the Bible says we are to be. Paul teaches us that we, are, we, sh we should come to a place where we are unconscious of sin, where the church has done nothing but try to create a more sensitivity in our conscience to sin, which is exactly the opposite of what the Bible teaches. Praise the Lord. So God warned Adam and Eve. He said, the knowledge of evil came with a high cost, death. What? It made them conscious of their bad behavior. Before, God was just good. God was just love. God was just peace. God was just joy. The presence of the Lord. It was just wonderful. Now all of a sudden, because they know good and evil, now they're afraid of God because they know they've done evil and they know God is only good. They, didn't, they were doing the same kind of things before. But the knowledge of evil, the knowledge of evil, caused them to flee God, to run from God. The love of God. This was God showing nothing but love and acceptance and compassion and, and being their source for everything. That's, what God, that's how God revealed himself originally. That was always his intent. But the moment they had a knowledge of the dark side, all of a sudden God becomes something to run from. God becomes something to hide from. And if you remember, they made some fig leaves to cover themselves. They all immediately began to, to do works to cover up what they thought was going to be judged. Our first parents wanted to be like God, and they were willing to pay the price, and we've been paying it ever since. Let's look at Romans uh, chapter 6, verse 23. I've got three scriptures here in a row, Sheila, beginning with Romans 6, 23. For the wages of sin is death. Now look at this. It, it, just, it bears exactly what I'm saying. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. He's not talking about sin. He's saying, that here's the problem. The problem is you're dead. And you need to be made alive. So the wages of sin is death. 
But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. All right, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 22. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Praise the Lord. Got to be born again. All right, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. And you hath he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins. He quickened, made alive. That's what that word means. You hath he quickened, you hath he made alive, who were dead. Why were you dead? In trespasses and sins. Amen. Now, let me clarify that. Why were you dead? Not because of trespasses and sins. Trespasses and sins are the result of being dead. Adam and Eve were alive to God until they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Amen. Then they were separated. Now, not that God still didn't reach out to them and so forth and, and, and do things to protect them, but in terms of their, uh, their relationship or their salvation, if you will, their eternal life, it was stopped. Their eternal life ended the moment they ate from that tree. And their mortal life now had a deadline, had an end. Amen? So the real problem that we all face is death. Physical death for sure. But ultimately and far more seriously is spiritual death. Being cut off from God forever. You either die alone or you die in Jesus. Praise the Lord. In his death, in the death of Jesus, he swallowed up our death. And rose again. Yes. That's what the scripture teaches us. Yes. Victoriously over death, hell, and the grave. Yes. Praise God. Death loses its power. So when we die with Jesus, we really live. Yes. We never die again, actually. Once we were crucified with Christ, buried, and raised again, there will never be a death for us again. There cannot be spiritual death for us. And there may not even be physical death, depending on the return of the Lord. But if there's physical death, we will have a resurrected body, amen, but we're never going to die. Our dying is done. Our dying ended 2,000 years ago with Jesus. We're forever connected with God. And the testimonies you heard today, the prophecies that have been spoken, is evidence of that. Because you can't do that without the Spirit of God. You can't hear from God unless you have ears to hear. The ears you've got to have are spiritual ears because you're spiritually dead until you're born again. Praise God. So, amen. Let's look at uh, Colossians 2, verses 20 through 23. Verse, back to tw verse 20, if you can, Sheila. 20. 20. Wherefore, if ye be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, that, that's talking about the law. The rudiments of the world, he's talking about the law. Wherefore, if ye be dead with Christ, and you have to do a word study on that, but I'm telling you, that's what it is. You can check it out for yourself. Wherefore, if ye be dead with Christ from the, you can just put the word law in there. Why, as though living in the, world, are you subject to ordinances? So in other words, if, you, if you're dead with Christ, yeah. you're dead from the effects or the demands of the law. Right. So why then, as though you were, and we're in the world, but we're not of the world, why then, as if you were still of the world, yeah. are you subject to ordinances? Yeah. If you're not of the world anymore, you're not subject to the ordinances that the world is subject to. Yeah. Touch not. Then he goes on to explain that. Touch not, taste not, handle not. Verse 22 and 23. Which all are to perish with the using after the commandments and the doctrines of men. Which things have indeed a show of wisdom and will worship and humility and the neglecting of the body, not in any honor to the satisfying of the flesh. So it looks good on the outside. 
It looks religious. It looks even spiritual to a religious person. But it has absolutely no meaning to God. It's actually idolatry. So when all is said and done, rules and practices, all of the rituals and the disciplines and all the latest methods and all the techniques uh, and all the procedures and the approaches to spirituality, all those things are useless. Praise the Lord. External conformity like that never brings internal transformation. It will not because it cannot. Outside cleanup can never bring about inside cleanup. If that were possible, the Pharisee, Jesus wouldn't have called them whited, washed tombs. He said, you look good on the outside, but inside's dead men's bones. In other words, inside you're still dead. You're still spiritually dead, even though you look alive on the outside. External rule keeping doesn't touch the source of sin or even temptation. It doesn't penetrate because the gospel frees us from all of that, but the law holds you to it. The curse of the law. Amen? So since it's all, of, all of this is true, have you ever asked yourself, this is, again, I don't want to belabor and embarrassed on by coming back to him, but that what he was saying about the conversation he had with God is so right on. Because his, his thoughts leading up to that are like all of ours. Because that's what we've been taught all of our life. That's what we assumed has to be the truth because that's what every preacher preached. But if, if all of this that we're talking about here is true, and I, I, I know that it is, then have you ever asked yourself, why do I avoid the gospel then? Grace is what I'm talking about, the gospel of grace. The same reason Adam and Eve ran from God when they had an awareness of evil, when they had a sin consciousness, God always seemed threatening. He didn't seem as inviting, as in loving and, and uh, accepting and, and uh, all the things that we've heard testified to this morning. He seemed angry. Why? Because I know I did something I shouldn't have done. But God isn't judging us based on what we're doing. He's based on whether we're dead or alive. Christians avoid the gospel at some level every day. I do, you do, we all do. And it's a flight from God. It's a fear that God won't do what God has promised based on me instead on him based on my knowledge of good and evil. If I only knew good, I'd only know God. So, you know, what the gospel does, it obliterates me. That's what he says. You are crucified. You have been buried. You're a new creature. You, you don't live anymore. The you that's now alive Paul says, but it's no longer me that lives. It's Christ in me that lives. So what the gospel does is it, it, it wipes us out. It obliterates us. And suddenly life is no longer about me. It's not about my little world, my standards, my rituals, my rules, my preferences, my, my sense of right and wrong. It's not about my strengths or my weaknesses or my achievements or my failures. The gospel erases us, which is why we avoid it. But the erasing of self is the key to our freedom. That is the gospel. It's no longer about us. Under the law, it was all about us. Now it's no longer about us. It's about Jesus. That's why God refers to us as the body of Christ. He doesn't see us. And yes, he sees us and our needs as individual needs, but he sees us as Christ. The gospel doesn't take you deeper into yourself. The gospel takes you away from yourself. That was the, the hell of the 60s for those of us who lived there. 
and can still remember some of it. I took notes. That's the only reason I remember any of it. But all of the drugs, all of the, the running off to a different life and going to Mexico or getting in a commune or going wherever it is that we went, all the different things that we did, it was about trying to find ourselves. And when we found him, like Charlie Brown said, we met the enemy and he's us. The thing I was looking for was what I was trying to get away from and didn't have sense enough to know it. This is about not me. It's about him. Because there's not enough good things I could do in all of my life to make up for the bad that I am. Yeah. Period. If I'd never done anything other than just be born, yeah. I was stuck with that sin. Yeah. Let's look at Colossians chapter 3, verse 3. And then we'll have one more scripture after this and we'll wrap up. So you can all take your wives to dinner. I was going to take my wife home and she was going to barbecue. <laughs> Obviously, the Lord wants to give her a day off, even if I wasn't, praise God. So, Hallelujah. He still loves me. And, well, by faith, Sally does too. Hallelujah. So, this is Colossians chapter 3, verse 3. For ye are dead. Everybody say dead. dead. You're dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. That's good news. I mean, for all of us, that's good news. Praise the Lord. But our natural tendency is to focus on ourselves, on our obedience or our lack of obedience, on our performance, whether it's good or it's bad. Amen? On our holiness, instead of on Christ and his obedience, his performance, his holiness for us. For us. That's what it was done. For us. Praise God. All right, Romans 11, uh, verse 36. For of him and through him and to him are all things, to whom be glory forever. Amen. For of him, through him, and to him are all things, to whom be glory forever. Amen. So, Returning to the gospel is returning to reality. It reminds us that sin enslaves by making us big. Praise the Lord. The gospel frees us by making us small. Insignificant, in other words. You're no longer a part of the equation when it comes to salvation. It's for him, through him, and to him. The gospel is about shrinking us and the part that we play. Because the law was all about blowing us way out of proportion to where we thought we actually could be like God. I mean, think about it. Go back to, to Genesis, and what was it they believed? They believed if I get more knowledge, I'll be like God. So the law comes and gives us a knowledge of sin. A greater awareness of sin than ever man had ever had before because it specifies every little thing. What, which did what? Made us feel bigger because we're going to do these things and that will make us like God. Only God could keep the law or fulfill the law. What are we doing when we think we're keeping the law? We're trying to do the same thing that Adam and Eve did. We're trying to be like God. And the, and the whole point of this is there's only one God. And nobody else can be like God. So you either accept him as a loving father and savior, or you make yourself at enmity with God. That's the gospel. That's the good news. We shrink. God gets bigger. God becomes all and in all and through all and every. He becomes everything to everybody. And all that we have need of. Christianity is not, and I'll, I'll close with this, Christianity is not the move from vice to virtue. That is not what Christianity is about. That's what the law was about, but it could never happen. So Christianity is not about vice to virtue, but rather it's a move from virtue to grace. To move from what I can do to be virtuous and to be good, I move from that into a state of acceptance with God 
back to the garden. Back before, think about it, back before there was a knowledge of good and evil. That's what the gospel does. It puts me back in a place of, of, of grace, not virtue. The moment they ate from that tree, they were in a position where their virtue is what was depending on their relationship with God. They could not do it. The whole of history, man's history, and all of the Bible teaches us that. So to go back and take Christianity down that same path is going back to the tree of knowledge of good and evil over and over and over. And that's what causes us to run and hide from God and try to make up stuff to cover ourselves and make ourselves acceptable. God did a good thing. He did the perfect thing. And it took me from virtue to grace. It's not about me. It's about him. And I simply trust him. And because of that, I can expect the same as Adam and Eve did before, the, before they ate from that tree. I can expect God to feed me, to clothe me, to, pro, to protect me against all the wild animals in the world, all the, all the threats and all the evil and all the rest. I can expect that every day God's going to be walking with me. Every day it's going to be okay. Every day I can expect God's going to bless me. He's going to prosper me. He's going to give me. Look, they, got more than, they, they had way more than they needed in that garden. They had everything. All they were asked not to do is don't become aware of your need for virtue. Just trust that I love you so much, I'm going to pour more on you. There's more trees to eat from. There's more animals here. There's more. You don't need clothes even. It's a perfect environment. I said, I think it was Wednesday night. What a, what a deal. A man, a woman, acreages, and naked. <laughs> what guy wouldn't want it? <laughs> Hallelujah. That's just me. Yeah. <laughs> Praise the Lord. But, Amen. We've gone from virtue to grace. Because God so loved the world. Amen. Amen. Let's give him a hand clap this morning. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. So the next time you're feeling kind of uptight, don't. Forget about it. Grace has put you back in the garden, back into that. That's what we were redeemed to, that original condition, before there was a consciousness of sin. When sin comes to your mind, I'm not listening. I'm not saying if you do something. I'm saying... Whenever you feel guilt, whenever you feel shame, whenever you feel condemned, yep. you need to say, that lion, de that's the devil again. Here he comes again. Yep. Have a bite. It's really going to help you to know more about yourself, to know what causes you to act like the idiot that you act like sometimes. No, the less you know about that idiot and the more you know about the perfect one, yep. the better off you're going to be. Yeah. I've found that I can be just as idiotic today as I was when I was 25. That's almost impossible to believe if you knew me when I was 25. Yeah. Amen? But if I, don't, uh, if I start delving into every weird behavior that I have and thought that comes to my mind and reasons where, you know, you start thinking, well, I wonder why they said that. You know, I wonder what I said to say, cause them to say. You know, have you ever done that where you start yeah. analyzing everything that's going on in a conversation? Well, I wonder what they meant by that. Well, they probably just meant what they said. And you want to make it into something else. But well, that's what I'm saying. Out of us comes all of these twisted and weird, you know, bizarre kinds of thinking. Yeah. Just forget about it. Forget about you and look to him. Amen. That's your identity. Yeah. You don't have any consciousness of sin. You're in a good place with a good God who's supplying all good things yeah. for you. That's his plan for your life. That's his purpose for you. Amen for us to grow in that and in the power of his might. Amen? Praise the Lord. God bless you all. Hallelujah. God bless all of our mothers. Amen. Uh, have a great Mother's Day. And uh, even though it's raining, the rain's good. It's make the gardens grow and everything will be beautiful. Praise the Lord. God bless you. You're dismissed in his beautiful name. Hallelujah.